Man, that was a pretty good introduction, wasn't it? Not the best. The best was where I was a few months, months ago. The guy that was supposed to introduce me didn't show up, so I, I introduced myself. But other than that, that was a, a pretty good introduction. Thank you, Johnny, from wherever in hyperspace you're at. I appreciate that, all right? If you have your Bible, and I know some of us have that new camouflage Bible, we just can't find it, but if you have your Bible, turn with me please to Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3. And I want to share with you this morning how to have the courage to confront and face the demands of reality. Now hear me, young men, young ladies, not the reality you expect you'll have, not even the reality that some of you have been promised you'll have, not even the reality that some of you have trained to have. You have to learn to courageously face the realities and the demands of reality. Now in some circles that's called striving to become a level five leader. Everything rises and falls on leadership, but now hear me, everything, every marriage, every relationship, every business, every dream, every ministry, every sport, every entertainment act, it all rises, whatever your dream, it will rise and fall on leadership. But the other side of that coin, and I ask you to write it down, you got a pen, pencil, lipstick, mascara, crayon, anything, or write it in your, in your whatever your favorite font is, but write this down. Not only does everything rise and fall in leadership, Everything rises and falls on the character of the leader. Now, I know we have a lot of folks that want to debate, is it more important to be a disciple or to be a leader? You can't be one without another. We believe leadership begins at the feet of Jesus. We believe he's the greatest leader to ever live. Even if you would have walked in halfway through that scene in the upper room where Jesus is on his knees, already thinking and comprehending what he's about to face, and he's on his knees washing the feet of the disciples, I promise if you stuck your head in that room for five seconds, you would not have any question who the leader was in that room, even though he was washing feet, doing something only that the lowest servant would do. So character matters, leadership matters, being a follower matters, but listen, you don't just want to be a disciple in the sense that you go to Bible study, you have quiet time, you check the box. I don't believe you would be at Liberty University if you didn't desire with all your heart to be a young man or a young lady of influence. So with your permission, please give it because it's the only thing I'm prepared to talk about today, but with your permission, I would like to share with you about becoming a level five leader. And let me just tell you, no one here is anywhere near a level five leader. And that has to do primarily with your age because it takes years and years of experience to reach that last really level that some people say is the highest leadership we have on the planet. It takes experience. Now some people have 20 years experience, they think, but in reality they may have four or five years experience and then they keep repeating it over and over again. The key is to live and capture every moment, make your life count. So, with your permission, let's talk about how to courageously meet the demands of my reality. You gotta ask yourself the question, is my potential really being realized or is it being squandered? Is my dignity being disqualified or soiled or is my dignity being enhanced? It's the kind of question only you can ask. You know, I'm amazed when you speak to a lot of high schools, and I've been in about 10,000 of them all across the planet, it's amazing when you ask young people, are you really preparing for your future? And I promise you, even at a university where folks are supposed to be highly motivated and highly engaged, some of us go about preparing for our future like it's a family sack race. You know, we're distracted, we're joking, we're laughing, and I like to shuck and jive, I like to have a good time, but there's gotta be a time that you have a laser-like focus 
on what matters most. Now, life is great. Life is an adventure. There should be fun. But I want to be straight with you. You can't approach your future like it's not that big a deal. Because I promise you, as Sherlock Holmes would say, the game is afoot. So Ephesians chapter 3, let's begin looking at how to meet the demands of reality by looking at one of the secrets of the Apostle Paul. The Bible tells us in the New Testament, there are three great doxologies. You know what a doxology is. Every church used to have one when your mom and dad were your age, where we would go to church, big church, it started at 11, get over Tuesday, I think. But uh, we'd go to big church, and we'd sit so far back by the time we heard what the preacher said, it was a rumor. And we would sing at the end of every service the doxology. And a doxology goes something like this. Now unto him who is able, or unto him who is faithful. And a doxology means to praise God. There are three doxologies in the New Testament. First of all, in the book of Jude, it says, unto him who is able to keep us from falling. And then in Romans chapter 16, there's another doxology, unto him who's able to keep you stabilized and balanced. And then Ephesians 3.20, some of you know it, now unto him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we would ask or think, according to the power of the works in us. To him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus and to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I don't want to imply I'm a Greek scholar, but my background, six broken homes, a junkie for four years, busted four times, dropped out of school twice. I was labeled A-D-D-D-D-D-D-D. They said if I was in the room, I didn't pay attention, and nobody paid attention. And I didn't bother anybody, I just ate that white paste, sorry, sorry. but anyway. But, uh, and then I was labeled dyslexic, very dyslexic. And uh, I struggle with a lot of things still to this day. And that's when you see things backwards. Sometimes I'd be so discouraged about some of my learning disabilities and challenges, I'd want to throw myself in back of the bus. Oh, sorry, you'll get that later after... Uh, sports center, I promise. But I want you to know, listen to what it says. I had to take Greek and Hebrew sometimes five or six times. So I'd like to think, same class by the way, but I'd like to think that makes me a scholar. You ready? Here's what it says in the original grammatical construction of that verse in the Greek. You ready? Listen to this. God is able to do anything we ask him to do. Secondly, God is able to do anything we dare not ask, but would merely imagine. Third, God can do far more than this. Fourth, God can do very far more than this. God can do far more than you've ever imagined the far he could do. That's literally what it says in the original. So no wonder when Paul dealt with reality every day, when Paul dealt with reality every day. Sometimes reality comes when you're not ready. All right. So let's walk through these, you ready? Number one, everybody's gonna be paying attention now, no doubt, all right. Number one. Cute ladies, never trust guys on cameras. Just know that, all right? Ask the girlfriend of the Alabama quarterback. All right, uh, number one. Sorry. Number one, if you want to have the courage to face reality, and I'm going to ask you to write this down. It's good, I promise. You and I forget the majority of what we hear within 24 hours. That's a fact, scientific fact. We forget 85 to 88% of what we hear within 24 hours. We don't write it down. Now, that's a fact. It's true all over the planet. No matter your IQ, your grade point, we forget the mass major- vast majority of what we hear if we don't write it down. And now we're in a day and age we don't seem to want to write anything 
down. Number one, I want to share with you some essentials. And I'm an old guy. I've been around a long time, still unbelievably cool, but I'm an old guy. Now, really, the therapist said I could talk about it. But uh, I want you to know, I want to share with you what you can know no matter how the world keeps changing. And by the way, my graduates that are about to graduate in, in, in a matter of weeks and maybe a month, and congratulations, but guess what? You're going to work till you're 70 or 75. There will be no Social Security. There will be no Medicare. It's not a political statement. That's just a fact. We don't have enough population because of something we legalized in 73, and now over 60 million uh, no longer with us. But we no longer have the support to fight the wars that need to be fought or defense around the world. Uh, again, no political statement. But we don't have the resources to keep a contract with people. So guess what? You're going to work. You're going to live to be probably 90 plus. Uh, life expectancy is continuing to go up. But guess what? You're going to work till you're 70 or 75. So the education you're getting. Remember when I said don't prepare for the future like it's a family sack race? but be focused and be passionate, give it everything you've got, listen to me. You're gonna have to do what you're gonna do for the next 50 years, and we don't even know what's gonna happen in five years, much less 50. So let me tell you what I promise you, you can count on the rest of your life, no matter what your reality will be in the world. Number one, don't disqual, don't, let me just say this, don't crucify your today between two thieves. Don't waste today. We're about to celebrate Good Friday. We're about to hear about the passion of Jesus. We're about to hear about his amazing atonement. And we know he was crucified between two thieves. But I've been doing this a long time, young people, and I'm telling you straight up with all my heart, don't crucify your today between two thieves, the thief of yesterday and the thief of tomorrow. If there's one thing you can count on, you can make peace with your past, you can shake off the dust from your past. First time I spoke at Liberty, it was in fact first time I spoke on this mountain, uh, it was a super conference for pastors. I had hair to my shoulders, and there wasn't a lot of people speaking anywhere with hair to their shoulders back uh, almost uh, 35 years ago here, all right? And Dr. Falwell took a chance on a young junkie who'd gotten saved. And I want you to know I had written a book called Drugs and Drinking, The All-American Cop-Out, because I'd just come out of the scene. And then I'd been asked to write a book about how to shake off the dust, how to make peace with your past. In fact, there was a professor at Liberty. His name was Dr. Ed Heinsen. And he helped me. He helped me. I don't want to bring this up. He'll want more royalties. But he helped me. Write the book, Shake Off the Dust. Let me tell you why. How do you overcome mistakes of your past? And ladies and gentlemen, some of us have so much baggage from our past. We're always looking over our shoulder. Some of us can't make peace with it. We can't let it go. We can't move on. Don't crucify your today between the thief of yesterday. The Bible says you can be made brand new. I don't care who you are. I don't care what you've done. I don't care where you've been or what you've been. Thanks to Jesus Christ, you and I can start over. I want you to know he's not just Savior, he's Deliverer. I remember going home and flushing all the drugs and all the booze, and all the rats were high in the sewer for months after that, all right? And you say, how do you know? Because they were walking down the hallway going, here, kitty, I mean, you know, so I, I remember going through withdrawal, and I remember the anger from the sexual abuse and the foster homes and the detention uh, centers, and being passed around like a pack, uh, piece of luggage. I had so much baggage, I needed a skycap, I needed a porter. When I gave my life to Jesus Christ, he not only forgave me and cleansed me, helped me get overcome alcohol and drugs, he set me free, he delivered me from my past. Don't let the thief of yesterday haunt you. Hear me on that. Number two, don't let the thief of tomorrow rob you of today. I'm going to do it tomorrow. I'm going to get right with God tomorrow. I'm going to quit going to that certain site tomorrow. Let me just teach you this, not teach, but share if I may. Today matters. Please write that down. Today matters. 
I purchase my tomorrow today. I'm not going to get much out of being here today. It's not going to do anything for me speaking to you today. I'm not going to get a lot out of speaking to you today. But let me tell you something. What I do today purchases my tomorrow. What I do today makes a difference in my destiny. Today matters. And if you want to know how to courageously face reality for whatever comes in the next 50 years or how long you have or we have until the Lord blows the whistle and says, everybody out of the pool, listen to me. You better realize I've got to make today count. Now, we're going to talk a lot about relationships in just a moment. you got to do it today. Today is the only thing I can count on. But I promise you this, take it from an old guy, if I capture today, if I give today everything, if I make today count, it takes care of tomorrow. Number one, don't crucify today between two thieves, yesterday and tomorrow. Number two, private victories precede public victories. Now, I don't care who your favorite boxer is. If it's from history, it could be Muhammad Ali, it could be Evander Holyville. I've also heard Pacquiao, who just won again over the weekend. All right? Now, guess what? All three of them I've heard be credited with this quote, but I share it with you. Put down whatever your favorite boxer's name is. No doubt he said it at some time. When asked... Why do you get up and run from four to six when it's pitch black dark? Why are you in the gym for hours? They all say the same thing. If I want to look good when the spotlight is on, and by looking good, they're not talking about physical appearance. They're talking about being able to dominate, being able to win, being able to conquer, being able to survive. Here's what they all teach. If I want to look good when the spotlight's on, I got to pay the price when there's nobody else looking. What we do in private determines what happens in public. Jesus himself said, hear this, whatever you whisper in the ear of someone in an inner room will be shouted one day from the housetop. What you and I do in private, you can be a big shot preacher, you can be a big shot businessman, You can be the most famous disciplined athlete at the time in the world. You can be the most powerful politician. Listen to me. It doesn't matter what you do and I do. When you've lived a while, let me tell you what you learn. Nobody gets away with having a double life. And young men, young ladies, I just promise you, what happens in private, private victories precede public victories. And by the way, when someone is doing well, when someone is receiving favor, when someone accomplishes something, don't be one of those critical. Don't be one of those whiners. Don't be one of those, oh yeah, I wonder what they're really like or who gave that person that. Be somebody that rejoices when somebody else does well. Because I promise you this, if they're a phony and a fake, it'll be shouted from the housetop. It's not up to me. Number two, favor's not fair. But I believe God sees what most of us don't see. And you and I both know you can post something, you can make a comment, you can say something, but I've never had to apologize. I've never had to take back. I've never asked for a mulligan or a do-over for something I didn't say or I didn't do. Private victories. Remember the story of Joshua. Joshua's got his moment. He was a young person, tapped on the shoulder, He'd been preparing himself, just like you. And God said, it's your time. It's your moment. Everything he dreamed of and worked for was happening. Now he needed the Lord to hold back the Jordan so they could cross on dry land, just like the Lord had held back the Red Sea for Moses. Joshua's leadership and him being the man to lead the children of Israel, all of that was on the spot, spotlight. But Joshua had been faithful in private. You know the story. When they crossed the Jordan, he had them get 12 stones and build a memorial on the shore so all the generations would know God parted the Jordan and was giving the children of Israel the promised land. Guess what? Guess what else happened? Joshua then went 
and got 12 stones and built another memorial to the Lord, but this one he did in the middle of the Jordan. A few moments later, the Lord held back, took back his hand, the water began to flow. Guess what happened? Joshua's altar would never be seen again by anybody except who? The Lord. Private victories precede public victories. You want to have the courage to face reality? Remember what we do in private counts. So don't crucify your today between yesterday and tomorrow. Private victories precede public victories. Number three, learn how to build meaningful, lasting relationships. Young people, I promise you, the most neglected, please write this down. I always used to say, write this down for me, write this down for me. I'd be warning somebody about the scene. I'd be warning someone about their, David, their dating life or their private life, or I'd be trying to warn somebody. And I always would say, write this down for me, write this down for me. I got through speaking, I'm running to catch a plane. A young guy comes out in the parking lot, calls me by name. I don't want to be one of those speakers that says, hey, I, I'm here because I care about you, you matter to me. And then somebody try to ask you a question and you blow them off and you run on because you've got somewhere else to go. So I stopped. I said, yeah, what is it? He said, here. He said, I wrote all these down for you. And he gave me a list of everything I just said. So I no longer say, write this down for me. By the way, what do you say to a guy that gives you a list of everything you just said? I made him promise he'd never have children. But anyway, so I understand. Write this down because I promise you the most neglected leadership skill on the planet is the ability to build meaningful, lasting relationships. Can I give you my favorite definition of being a friend? It comes from 9-11. We saw that scene where everybody was running out of the buildings, but the firefighters and the policemen and those first responders, they ran into the building that everybody else was running out of. You wanna know what a friend is? And I'm talking about a meaningful, lasting friend. Not somebody that wants to be your friend when you're popular, not somebody that wants to be your friend when you can do something for them, but a friend. I believe a friend, when everybody else is running out of the room, not wanting anything to do with you, will walk in, take off their coat, pull up a chair, and say, what are we gonna do now? We need someone that'll be a friend. You need, I promise you, you want to look back in 30, 40 years and be known as not only a level four, a level five leader, you want to be able to look back and be an individual of influence. You want to be able to look at back and know that you really did find out God is able to do exceedingly abundantly beyond anything you can think or, think or ask. I promise you, learn to see people the way Jesus sees people. I promise you, treat everyone like they're a 10. And if you'll treat everyone like they're a 10, you'll be surprised that you'll never lack for meaningful, lasting relationships. And again, I want to be candid with you. Johnny Moore, Dr. Moore said some nice things, gracious things in the introduction. And I do have some amazing friends. But can I be candid with you? They were all small potatoes. And I certainly was when I met them. We were just doing life together. We were students together. We were in a small church together. We were in a small school together. We were, we were just getting started. You see, I'm always amazed at folks that go, oh wow, I can't believe you have a relationship with that person or that person or that person. When are we gonna get it? The most influential people that you could ever meet in the world, I promise you, for most of us, are in this room. And you're doing life together, you're going to class together, and you're getting started together, and you block and tackle for each other, and you try to have each other's back, and you pray for one another, and you encourage one another. You see, meaningful, lasting relationships is the difference between somebody that manipulates and somebody that leads, somebody that serves. You know, if you really want to be a leader, you've got to earn the right to be trusted. And I believe that comes by how we treat other people. So yes, what I do in private matters, in my dorm, or in Roanoke, or in Richmond, what I do on the weekend matters, what I do in my, when I go back home matters. 
what I do when I'm on the road away from my family in Orlando. That all matters. And I can't let anything from my past haunt me. And I don't want to be one of those people who keep saying, I'm going to get it together tomorrow. I'm going to really start tomorrow. I'm going to really change tomorrow. I've got to do that today. And then I'm going to genuinely, genuinely build those meaningful, lasting relationships. And then I want to challenge you. Avoid mission creep. Avoid the term. It's a military term. Mission creep. Now, young ladies, I know when I mention creep, you're already thinking of several guys and stop it. But I want you to know we're talking about either mission drift or mission creep. Let me tell you where it comes from. Robert Gates, former Secretary of Defense. He was a member of the National Security Council and the CIA for 26 years. He left politics. He went to Texas A&M, became the president of Texas A&M, and then President Bush during Iraq and Afghanistan said, I need you to come be our Secretary of Defense. And he not only served in a very critical time, but guess what? When we had a new president of a different party, and President Obama did something no one has done in a long, long time, he asked a person appointed by a Republican to stay and be over that effort in Iraq and Afghanistan and hopefully, hopefully be able to bring some things to some kind of conclusion. This guy, Robert Gates, is one of the great leaders of our lifetime. He's written a bestseller. It's called Duty. And you'll get a hernia picking it up. It's about 600 pages, all right? So you want to get it online, all right? But here's what I want you to know. Robert Gates made this statement. A daily battle for leaders is to fight mission drift, mission creep. You know what that's talking about? Every day, people pile more stuff on us. Every day, we're affected by somebody being in a bad mood, somebody saying something about us, somebody uh, saying we did something we didn't do, our emotions, our actions. Every day, we say we're on mission, building champions for Christ. Sounds good. And many of you came here, that's your mission. You want to be a champion. You want God to use you. You want God to use you to make a difference on the planet. But guess what? I've got to fight it. You've got to fight it. Your faculty's got to fight it. According to Gates, every leader every day has to struggle with mission drift or mission creep. And that's when stuff gets piled on you and it slows you down and you're not running towards your goal. You're just kind of barely making any progress, you're so weighed down, or number two, you start drifting away from your mission. So I want to challenge you. How do you avoid mission creep? Well, let me quote Joshua again. You ready? Because he was a young man just getting started. He booked in his life. So I want to challenge Liberty University. One phrase. Will you be willing to bookend your life? This is the beginning Oh, I know you've got, you know, 18 years, 20 years, 23 years, whatever, years of experience, but listen to me. Book in your life at the front end of Joshua's public life, public life, he's now tapped to replace Moses. How did he begin his life? How did he begin? What was his first act? Joshua chapter 3, guess what he said? Set yourself apart today. He said it to the children of Israel. God said it to him. He said it to them. Listen to what he said. Set yourself apart today so that tomorrow the Lord will do great wonders amongst you. You know how Joshua wanted to avoid mission drift? He remembered what his goal was. I am to set myself apart today. I am to pay the price today. I am to focus today. Remember I said he bookended his life? Well, that's what he said at the beginning. And you know the great famous saying, you've seen it on cards, you've seen it on posters. I have a mural over the staircase in my home of a giant scroll with these words on it. I see this every day when I'm home in Orlando. He bookended his life at the end of his life. You know the saying, as for me in my house, 
We will serve the Lord. He bookend his life, the beginning and the end. Set yourself apart today and watch God do great, great wonders amongst you. Now, ladies and gentlemen, when I built a manger in my heart at the age of 17, no future, turned down by 13 colleges, the army turned me down. We had a little something called Vietnam. They said, we don't need anybody. That'll make you feel good. Then I saw the movie Forrest Gump. That made me feel real good. They, they took Forrest Gump. They didn't want me. But I, I got through it. I got through it. So when I began my life, 13 schools said no thanks. Do you know I've been invited back to all 13 of those schools to either speak to teach, two of them had asked me to consider coming back and being their president out of the 13 schools that said no thanks. By the way, I made a statement to a reporter, all 13 of those schools that turned me down invited me to come speak. She said, I bet it felt good to turn them down. I said, are you out of your mind? I went back to every one of them and spoke. And when I got through, I looked at them and said, yo mama, because that's just what I believe God put on my heart, all right? So listen to me. I don't know if you've gotten off. I didn't mean to quote Hebrew there, sorry. I, I, I want you to understand. I don't know if you've gotten off to a good start academically. I don't know if you've really captured today. I don't know if you're pleased, if you feel like you're realizing your potential. But hear me when I tell you. Please hear me. When you build a manger in your heart, and you ask Jesus, the creator, to step out of heaven and step into you, when God comes into your life, when Jesus comes into your life, if God be for us, who in heaven's name could be against us? No matter who you are, no matter where you've been, no matter what you've been, no matter what somebody did to you, or maybe, heaven forbid, something you did to somebody, you and I can be cleansed, we can be forgiven, we can be changed, and we can be set free. So Liberty, listen to me. Go for it. Be all in and do it. Let's pray together. I'll even pray before we clap. All right, fair enough. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you, thank you for letting me be back at the Miracle on the Mountain. Thank you for the young men and young women in this room from literally all over the world. And Lord, most of all, I ask you to do what you did in my heart in life. Many times, sitting in a chapel, my mind preoccupied with a hundred other pressures, a lot of different things going on in my life, and yet there would be a few moments that I'd really kind of hone in. And I pray, Lord Jesus, I pray for everyone in this room that wants their life to count. I pray for forgiveness. I pray for mercy. I pray for safety. And Lord, I ask you to stir them and fill them and use them. Thank you that you're able to do more than we could even ask, dream, think, or imagine. Lord, help us as we serve you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. God bless you, man. Good luck. Thanks.